Welcome to the Georgetown Literary Festival 2021, Microcosmos. In this conversation, Magic of the Second Order, I will be speaking to Jan Wagner. Jan Wagner is a German poet and essayist and a translator of Anglo-American poetry. He has published seven poetry collections since 2001. Regentonen Variationen, Rain Barrel Variations, his sixth collection, won the award for the Leipzig Book Fair in 2015. Wagner's poetry has been translated into 40 languages. A selection in English, Self-Portrait with a Swarm of Bees, Selected Poems, translated by Ian Galbraith, was published in 2015 by ARC in the UK. Another selection, translated by David Keplinger, came out in 2017 with Milkweed Editions USA under the title The Art of Topiary, Selected Poems. Wagner has received various awards, among them the Anna Zegers Award, the Friedrich Hodelin Award, the Jean Kuhn International Poetry Prize, and the Georg Büchner Prize in 2017. He is a member of the German Academy of Language and Literature. Please welcome Jan Wagner. Thank you so much, Jan, for joining us today um, at this Georgetown Literary Festival podcast. I'd like to um, talk to you about your, po your poetics seem to be a kind of poetics of the everyday. And yet it's not the kind of malady of the quotidian that um, as Wallace, Wallace Stevens once said, that depicts or details a kind of um, dullness of routine, which I think is quite evident in, in some kinds of American literature um, and poetry. But what I find in, in your poetry that's very fascinating is that it seems to illuminate aspects and details of mundane reality um, with a kind of play playfulness and also a sense of wonder. Um, and I wonder how much that sense of playfulness and wonder, is that an important element in your poetry? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think those two aspects, uh, uh, um, playfulness, and and wonder uh, are at the at the very foundation of poetry, at least as uh, as, as far as I can see. Um, I think it was Mandelstam who said that the sense of wonder is the basic virtue of a poet, and uh, and in that sense, um, yes, it's uh, that, that uh, childlike quality of of walking walking through the world and trying to see it as if you'd see it for the first time. Um, which is what a child does, obviously, and which we all should do, and which I think if you write poetry is an absolute necessity uh, to to um, marvel at things with great wonder and to uh, to admire uh, their details and their simply being in the world, uh, which is rather marvelous. And um, and the other aspect, the playfulness, yes, I think um, um, the, the sense of Play the uh, the sense of playing around with with words and language, um, the strategy of approaching the world with language by playing with words and trying to get a grip on things on being by playing and applying words to the world uh, is is uh, uh, um, at the very core of writing poetry as well, and. Um, uh, in fact, I think it would be rather hindering if you'd if you'd uh, have too strong uh, a sense of of uh, um, gravity when writing poetry. Um, there's there's a great element of lust and of 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 pleasure in writing poetry and in reading poetry, which does not mean that it's a light thing to do, and uh, it doesn't mean that it's uh, it's uh, stuck in the everyday and in lightness. Uh, it does have a certain sense of gravity, but writing it, I think, should also create pleasure. And um, by creating pleasure or by offering pleasure and having a certain lightheartedness about it, I think uh, you get straight straighter to to the core and the gra um, grave problems um, which are there uh, and uh, which we have to deal with every day. Absolutely. Um, I think... I would say, and correct me if uh, you think this is a misinterpretation, but many of your poems, I feel, can be described as dingedichte, kind of thing poems or object poems, um, taking, taking off and um, perhaps focusing an, on a very close observation of a particular object or even a particular landscape, particular animal, um, and then taking off from there and looking into not just the essence, but also 
um, things that that object evokes, sometimes memories, sometimes fragments of experience um, that are seemingly uh, disconnected. Um, but I'm also wondering how, when you approach a poem, do you usually start with that the, the kind of object that you are observing, or is is there something else that propels you towards the observation of that object? Is it a, a particular memory, sound, um, or kind of experience? What is usually the, the case? <laughs> well, I think the beautiful thing about writing poetry, and uh, in fact the thing that uh, keeps poets young forever, I think, is that um, everything can be turned um, into a poem. You never know what is going to show up tomorrow and what will beg you to uh, turn it into a poem. That can be uh, a word or a sound, a rhyme. It can be uh, uh, an historical figure um, or a story, a narrative for that matter. But um, more often than not, for me at least, it is, uh, as you say, a ding, a thing, something which is there in the world, an animal, a plant. Um, but I write about filled mushrooms, chainsaws, and, and old motorcyclists as well. All that uh, uh, can, can be something you come across and immediately you know this has to be a poem. This uh, strikes me as something that uh, deserves a poem. Um, in general, I think all those great subject matters, uh, love, death, loss, they are, you know... Um, human constants and we have to deal with them every day and they come into poetry uh, whether you want it or not. Uh, they're the great subject matters, if you will, of poetry, of course, but um, for me it, it's, it was all, all, always true that if you start out wanting to write a poem about freedom or love, more often than not you, you end up with a very shallow poem um, sticking to those rather empty, great phrases. But if you start with an old shoe or um, a tooth or a chameleon and you focus on that very essential thing and try to, try to apply your language to it, try to apply your poem to it, um, you, you suddenly uh, let enter those great subject matters without even noticing. And that's, that's the moment when they um, can be visible as if for the first time, and you uh, you um, somehow get a grip even on those great and abstract subject matters. So I think if you start out writing a poem about freedom, you might end up having a very bad poem. But if you start focusing and writing about a lost glove in the gutter, you may turn out to have a wonderful poem about freedom. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. Uh, that that reminds me of something that Karen Leader wrote in her introduction to your to your book, Self Portrait mm -hmm. with a Swarm of Bees, and where she says that while almost all the poems dwell stubbornly in the physical, they also nudge almost mutely to the metaphysical, um, and that seems to reflect the human condition itself. This kind of that we are bound by a kind of finite existence in in the human flesh, and yet we also yearn somehow for something that is infinite and larger. Um, but as you said, sometimes the way to those great themes um, is through the, the physical detail. And so is that, um, is that for you, the, your way to the universal, is that through the particular? Is that a kind of um, path? Yes, at least I've always admired those great poets who, uh, who uh, um, achieve exactly that, uh, to... Um, to um, Visualize um, the the deeper problems by by uh, um, admiringly turning to the superficial or the so called superficial and the so called banal, be it uh, Charles Simic writing about watermelons or William Carlos Williams writing about a red wheelbarrow or Josef Brodsky who uh, uh, wrote this marvelous poem about a glass of water and normally you'd, uh, you 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 might uh, say. What are these poets doing? I mean, a glass of water, that's nothing at all. Uh, somebody who doesn't write poetry may say that. But if, if Brodsky writes about a glass of water, suddenly it's not only the glass of water, but suddenly it's a poem about love and loss and possibly also life after death um, when the, uh, the poet disappears and the rain um, uh, falls down hard on the empty places in Venice. Suddenly the glass of water is... Uh, um, 
part of the great circle of reproduction and uh, and, uh, and the simple or seemingly banal glass of water has become something altogether different. That's the beauty and the magic that poetry can achieve. And I've always admired those poets who can do that as if it was nothing uh, to have uh, to present their art uh, in a sort of a taken aback way, uh, in a modest way, but at the same time um, um, bringing into play playfulness again, all that makes a poem great. Absolutely. Um, that talking about magic, you did once describe poetry as a magic of the second order. Um, could you elaborate on what you mean by that? What is that? What is that magic, that particular magic of poetry? Is it a kind of alchemy that transforms, um, transforms the, the world into, into language and, and makes us encapsulate something that perhaps can't usually be described in words. How would you describe that? Um, it certainly is a process of transformation. And, uh, and the, feeling of, or the feeling of bliss when you read a wonderful and, and very successful poem uh, over and over again, it, it, it doesn't vanish, that kind of magical feeling. That's, uh, that's um, uh, magical in a way as well. Of course, uh, um, it's it, the, the times when poets were cons con considered to be prophets or uh, or seers uh, are long past, of course, and and uh, uh, of course, hardly anybody reads poetry nowadays, or not many people do. But still, um, the process of transformation is there, and um, and even if we can't actually pull a rabbit out of our heads, a real rabbit, we can write about a rabbit. Um, in a way that makes the reader of the poem about the rabbit sees the rabbit as if he sees a rabbit for the first time in his or her life. So uh, that process of transformation is also a process of adding something to the world or to our perception of the world. And, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, you could describe indeed uh, as a or in, in, with only a sly sense of irony as a magic of the second order. Um, Dylan Thomas, the great Welsh poet, said that uh, a successful, a very good poem uh, talks about the world and adds something to the world which will never be gone again. I mm. think that is true. Uh, mm. a, a, a poem um, writing successfully about whatever it is, um, a good poem, will leave something in the reader um, uh, forever, um, helping him to uh, deal with the world mm. and expanding his sense of being in the world and uh, expanding in that way the world as well. Um, that's that's a, a, a wonderful thing that poetry can do and I for one uh, can never um, listen to a nightingale without having Keats uh, lines mm. on a nightingale uh, in my ear. Um, or drink a glass of water without uh, um, having Brodsky in my ear as well, and so on. So um, the uh, the world becomes more plentiful with good poems, and uh, that is magical. Absolutely, and it, it's as if um, yes, that 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 kind of enduring poetry leaves its own kind of landscape, builds its own kind of subliminal landscape that we also move through as readers and as writers. Um, Nature is something that figures very greatly and pervades many of your poems. Um, but I, I would think that to, to describe you as a, as a kind of nature poet would be very misleading because I think many of us, when we think of what a nature poet is, we have the sense of perhaps um, someone who either um, writes about nature in a kind of sentimental way and this kind of idyllic sense of evoking nature or perhaps... Um, something like uh, the romantics, that this kind of melancholic um, sense and also the, the, um, the contrast between man and nature and these kinds of tensions, um, the yearning and, and the, um, the separation and the, the longing to get over that separation. But, but you're kind of, when you write about nature, it's not quite any of those things. And I think that um, you have you're a very particular way of, of engaging with, nature. Can you describe how nature informs your poetry? 
Well, um, obviously, I, I do like writing about animals uh, or um, plants. Yes. They they do figure. Um, I, I've written uh, about uh, chameleons and yucks as well as about uh, uh, um, uh, several birds and dogs. And, and, uh, and unfortunately, there are so many creatures out there that um, <laughs> the material for poetry is uh, endless. But... Um, um, as you say, I wouldn't consider myself to be a, a, a nature poet. I would never call myself that at all, yeah. because that that uh, term or title, nature poet, always implies that there's some sort of withdrawal from the world into some yes. sort of idyllic realm. Yes, that is not the case at all. Absolutely. And uh, it's uh, um, first of all, they're just there to wander at, just like uh, a fence post uh, would be for if you want to write a poem uh, or um, something else. A figure, a narrative, uh, some some detail, some smell. Um, so the animals and the plants are there to to marvel at and to to play with, to turn to be turned into a a poem. Um, but at the same time, I think it's curious that you can't write poems about nature um, today without having bearing in mind uh, the fragility of it all. Uh, mm -hmm. Curiously, nature poetry. Uh, even if I wouldn't uh, uh, call my poet at all nature poetry, but nature poetry today always, I think, now implies some political aspect as well, since yes. the, uh, the the loss of all those creatures. I mean, you write, you you may write about some animal today, which is uh, gone from the surface of the world tomorrow. So all that uh, sense of loss and fragility, I think, is implied if you write about nature nowadays. Mm, so no, that's very um, true. With the years, I think. Uh, it has uh, adopted a natural political stance as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Nature poems have, I mean. Um, but for me, it's uh, it's uh, really um, an invitation. Or every animal or plant is an invitation for me to 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 gaze and to uh, uh, and to look at um, what is there, and uh, which is really quite bizarre and and astonishing uh, there in the world. Of course. If you write about something, no matter what, and that holds true for a fence post or a stone as well, you write about yourself as well. So looking, um, somebody said that you, of course, try to look with the eyes of the animal back onto yourself. So uh, I think that that certainly is true. It's a sort of trying to imagine another mode of existence as well. And mm -hmm. that's a, a wonderful thing that poetry can do as well. Uh, where else can you try to say, I am a stone, and actually try to imagine how it would be to be a stone in the world, or yeah. to try to look with the eyes uh, of a cow or a pig onto yourself and marvel back at yourself. That's something yes. the poetry can do as well, and that's a very liberating uh, and uh, and also sobering effect. So trying mm -hmm. to uh, or or um, maybe um, making making the human being writing poetry a bit more modest, which he or mm -hmm. she should be. Mm -hmm. That's um, That actually relates to uh, something I've observed in your poetry as well, that you don't often put yourself in the poems um, in in the sense of an I. There's very a few places you appear as an I, but of course, as you said, your observations and the way you, um, you kind of embody all those other creatures and beings and landscapes and, and objects and ding um, things. Um, and that is, that is where you find perhaps your presence as a poet as well. But it's, it's quite different from, um, from, I think, many contemporary poets who, who tend to put the, the eye, um, the figure of the poet, directly in that. Is that, a conscious, um, is that a conscious part of your poetry or is that just something that has developed naturally? Well, it is something that has developed, but it's something I'm, mm. I'm very conscious of, of course. Yes. And uh, and it's also true that I've always admired, or there are certain poets I have admired, who uh, mm. um, who uh, hardly ever use the word I. Uh, mm. You've mentioned Wallace Stevens. I think it's hard mm. to find uh, the mm. I in Stevens' poetry, or you don't find it very often. Mm. Yes. Um, and, and other poets uh, come to mind as well. Um who uh, withdraw from their poems and and uh, and try to leave the space to language itself and to the poem itself. I think that's uh, something uh, which uh, attracts me a lot. Mm. Um, and also, 
uh, there's a certain dramatic aspect to poetry. I think if I if I uh, mentioned the stone and the and the possibility of saying I am a stone in a poem, mm-hmm. uh, that hints to the possibility that in poetry you can also adopt roles. For me, the I is just another role you can adopt in the poem. And I do use the word I, but I can be uh, um, uh, Christopher Columbus as a child. I can be uh, some uh, um, uh, um, experientialist uh, uh, scientist from the uh, 17th century, or I can be um, um, a flea in a coat. I can be all that. And and it's one of the beauties of writing poetry, I think, that uh, you can slip in and out of other identities. Mm-hmm. You can actually travel through time. You can uh, adopt other ways of being and, and uh, um, put them on like a gown for 10 or 12 lines. That's beautiful. So yes. the expectation that people seem still seem to have that uh, every poem is a very... Um, um, outspoken text and about yourself and your confessional sufferings. Confessional somehow, uh, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, or confessional. Mm. Um, of course, there are wonderful poets who do that and mm. wonderful poems have been written out of that perspective. And uh, um, But uh, more often than not, I think it's uh, um, more exciting for me to uh, uh, adopt some other role and to use the I as uh, another mask. Um, Fernando Pessoa, the Portuguese poet, was some, uh, somebody oh, who comes yes. to mind immediately, yes, who, who obviously created a whole universe of, of, of uh, um, writers. Yes. <laughs> he was writing in or he was writing out of those characters uh, and, and thus developing uh, a whole uh, world of possible ways of writing. That's uh, very attractive. And uh, and uh, and very convincing too, and I think uh, it would be would be a pity to renounce that mm. possibility of poetry. Yes, and you've mentioned um, quite a few poets who you admire. Um, could you speak about some of your early influences um, as as a poet? And I'm thinking particularly also of some of the German poets uh, who might have influenced your work. Could you? Uh, I've read um, that you were influenced early on by Georg Trakel and also uh, Georg Heim. Could you maybe speak about some of the influence? And do you see traces of their poetry in your work still? Um, I do. Uh, I think that's, uh, even if other people don't see it, I think mm. you, uh, um, mm. every, every poet is very aware of the traces left by those people uh, he or she admired. Um, there may be small traces and and uh, almost uh, invisible, but I think they are there. As you said, I I I was very influenced by the so-called early expressionist poem, uh, poets in Germany. Um, Georg Heim, I believe, is less less known uh, in the world, uh, in the English-speaking world, or the, the world uh, in general, than Georg Trakel, who is a lot more famous. But both of these Georgs were very important for me. Trakel obviously is a magical mm. poet, a mysterious I love, poet. I love Trakel as well. Oh yes, and very, very disturbing as well. Uh, yes. um, uh, a painter at the same time, uh, one of those great masters of color, um, and a very um, uh, deep poet who who uh, who. And that's uh, that's uh, something to praise. I think whom you can read over and over again. Uh, throughout your life, you will always discover something new in Trakel, and and you can carry your Trakel with you and, and, yes. and until uh, you're uh, in old age. And and uh, Trakel will always stay young on the other side. Of course, he died very young as well, but I mean his yes. poetry will always stay <laughs> fresh <laughs> and young. Um, so his way of writing, uh, I admired a lot. Georg Heim is a poet who's uh, um, less mysterious maybe, but a master of, of language as well, a master of the metaphor, of the visual, the striking visual image, also of colors, also a painter of words, or a painter with words. Uh, and he, um, his, his uh, traces I can see very clearly, he's uh, very fond of uh, the um, strong iambic line, a certain meter in his poems, mm-hmm. and, and uh, that I discover and rediscover again and again in my poetry as well. The uh, the visual metaphor, the visual, the clear and striking image 
uh, um, Heim was fond of, I'm fond of uh, very much as well. Um, and uh, and also the uh, the play with uh, forms. Heim was a great writer of sonnets, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a passion I can share, uh, and I do share. Uh, playing with old um, or seemingly old traditional forms is something I, I like to do as well. So Heim and Trakel, Rilke, I think, is somebody, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke is someone, yeah. especially if you like Ding Gedichte, as you pointed yeah. out, is someone you can't, <laughs> you can't do without. Uh, Hölderlin is one of those oh. great masters and also, um, uh, um, in a way, uh, uh, linked to Trakel. You can, can read Trakel and Hölderlin alongside very well. Um, but, um, uh, also, somebody more more recent, and I don't know whether he's known uh, in your uh, parts of the world, uh, um, uh, uh, Peter Huchel, a poet from mm. East Germany, also mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, a master of the of the metaphor. Um, mm. So he would be very important as well. But um, from early on, I was very influenced by uh, uh, English language poetry. Um, due to a teacher who was a Shakespeare fanatic uh, and who, who uh, also uh, um, encouraged us to read John Donne, uh, William Blake, um, all those poets who are not necessarily um, a, a, you know, a duty uh, in, in reading in, in German high schools, but uh, mm. who he uh, uh, strongly encouraged us to read them. So I from early on, <clears throat> discovered English language poetry, poets like uh, um, Auden or Ted Hughes, and mm. especially uh, at the very beginning, Dylan Thomas. So mm -hmm. if, I, if I would have to name one poet who was, uh, uh, was enthusiastic about when I started reading, uh, that would have been, I think, Dylan Thomas, the great Welsh mm. poet. Yes. That's wonderful. The, I you mentioned um, Georg Heim's use of traditional forms, and that's actually some, something else I wanted to ask you about. You have, um, in your own poetry, you use various, vast and various traditional forms in your poetry, um, from sonnets to sestinas to haiku. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, what is, what is that like also? Is that, do you find that the, the kind of restrictions and discipline that the use of a traditional form necessarily um, places upon um, the composition of poetry, do you find that it, it releases or urges a, a different kind of freedom um, and also a, a more precise articulation? Uh, I do have friends, poet friends, who, who say they would never, ever write a sonnet or write Sistina or a Villanelle mm -hmm. or a Pantum mm -hmm. or whatever um, because they, they, they uh, think it's a restriction uh, and, and something that, that makes their... Um, um, their poetic world narrower and and uh, grants them less liberty. For me, as you say, uh, the the opposite is true. I think it's uh, you you gain um, a lot of freedom by using those restrictions. That's a paradox of way, of course. But but uh, um, those those restrictions, uh, a sistina or sonnet or also just simple rhymes offer. Um, um, or, or, or put upon you um, are really, um, I think, an invitation to 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 enter the play we were starting out with. That sense of playfulness is there in those forms, and the restrictions uh, encourage you or force you to uh, to think anew, to try out new paths which you hadn't seen before, to somehow wriggle loose from that you know, strict corset and dance more freely. So um, it is indeed a, a way of, of, uh, of uh, um, letting yourself be forced into new, um, new uh, positions of thought, into new uh, um, metaphorical realms. Um, and doing that or, or um, letting yourself be, uh, be forced into those directions by a form guarantees that that at some point, at least for me, that's true. At some point, on that path, you're sitting there with your poem, whether it still is a sestina or sonnet or not. But you are surprised 
by what's there on the page. You're, you're uh, in th that wonderful position of being surprised by your own poem, by learning something about the world or yourself or, your, or about language by the very poem you've written yourself. That's mm. uh, quite astonishing too. Um, you're sitting there saying, I, I did not expect that poem to turn out the way it did. But it did, and uh, and that's something that, that that strict form and traditional form can uh, do to you as well. So I think the poet who's, who's who's put it most wonderfully was the American poet John Ashbery, who of course uh, himself played around with, well, with the pantoum, with Villanelles and a Sistina. And some uh, interviewer asked him, Mr. Ashbery, why why do you do that? Uh, why do you uh, take upon yourself the suffering? Uh, that is involved with writing a Sistina. And Ashbury said, it's really like going downhill on a bicycle, um, but not your feet are driving the pedals, but the pedals are driving your feet and you do not know where you will end up. That's the beauty of traditional forms. They steer you into some unknown field or possibly a swamp, but it's always <laughs> exciting. That's a wonderful way of putting it. Um, yes, um, I'm, I'm curious also about um, how you view German poetry today. Um, you're obviously steeped in many, in many poets, not just of Germany, but also of the world, um, of, of various generations from the past. Um, but also, what about the, the current contemporary scene in German poetry? Do you find it to be an exciting time in poetry? It's a, it's a very exciting time in German poetry. All the great old masters are still writing, uh, poets who began writing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, but since 15 or 20 years or so, there has been a younger generation of poets writing who uh, who uh, um, are really have who have really brought uh, along a new wave of of, of good German poetry. Um, in fact, people have been saying. I mentioned the early expression of poets like Georg Hein, Georg Trakel. That was the one of the golden golden times for German poetry in the tens or twenties of the last century, and people have compared uh, our time to to those uh, golden days of poetry. And and I think that's uh, it's fair to say that uh, the the wealth of uh, stunning and original poetry written today. Uh, is quite something. It's, um, uh, it's hard to say why uh, why it is so, but uh, I think one of the reasons is that you do not have to subscribe anymore to some school of poetry. In the 60s, uh, um, uh, 70s, um, as elsewhere, uh, you were either a, a traditional poet or uh, an avant-garde poet, an experimental poet. So um, uh, basically there were two Two schools, maybe, and uh, all I think all young poets starting out uh, with poetry today uh, don't have to um, subscribe to those schools anymore. But they can take for their own poetry whatever is good from those old schools and develop their own um, their own uh, way of speaking, their own way of writing. So there's a great wealth of very different voices uh, um, from different schools. You have. Well, possibly nature poetry or um, uh, poets playing with a tradition of nature poetry, uh, but also political poetry, uh, language poetry. And in the best and most interesting cases, all of these things come together in one poet. So it's uh, it's an exciting time for German poetry. Um, uh, like uh, as it is in other European uh, countries uh, or countries in the world as well, um, at least. Uh, for somebody writing poetry, I think uh, it's it's a relief to see that uh, those um, those um, people um, saying that poetry is a is a is a dead business and uh, something which doesn't interest anybody anymore are not right at all. It's, yes, it's quite a lively quite a lively time for poetry, mm -hmm. and uh, and luckily I think uh, that uh, holds true for the audience as well. Mm. Yes. Jan, you're also a prolific translator, and um, you've translated quite a lot of um, Anglo-American um, poetry into German. Um, can you speak a bit about your experience as a translator, and, and also as an experience of a poet who has been translated into many languages? I think, if I'm not mistaken, 40 languages, um, if not more. Um, 
What is that experience of translation? Excuse me. What is that experience of translation um, like for you? Does it also inform your own poetry? Um, it, it certainly does. Um, uh, of course, you, you can't speak all the languages. Uh, um, sometimes you just have to marvel at what what has been done to your poem in a language you do not know. But if you do speak the language, uh, the process is even more interesting. Translating a poem is one of the um, difficult um, but bountiful things I think you can you can do uh, with your time. Um, and uh, uh, contrary to to what is normally being said about translating a poem, that uh, poetry famously is what's lost in translation. People are always talking about the loss uh, that is involved with poetry or poetry translation. I think it's, uh, uh, you, uh, it, it's much more fruitful to talk about the gains um, because every translation adds something as well. Of course, you lose some, you know, some, of course you have some images, some rhymes, some formal matters. Uh, you can't always translate uh, phrases, idioms, uh, all the uh, all the playfulness of the original poem. But at the same time, uh, on the other side of the scales, you add something to the poem which the original poet could not have added at all in the first place, because uh, the, the means and techniques simply do not exist in the original poet's language. So I think um, uh, sometimes. Uh, the language a poem is being translated into uh, can add some grammatical um, um, feature, some uh, um, semantical feature that only exists in that language, some case which uh, is only there in that grammar of that particular language that maybe the original poet would have used him or herself if it would have been available to her, uh, but it isn't. So. Um, um, I think a, a good translation sometimes can make the original poet say, I wish I could have said that in my own language, and I'm very thankful that you did it in yours, because it mm -hmm. adds something to my original poem that I could not have added. That's mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, gains you get uh, when translating um, uh, poetry, which doesn't uh, mean that it's not a difficult thing to do, and some some painful thing to do as well, because you lose things as well, but you can yeah. make up for those losses with... Uh, Many beautiful gains, I think. Yes, I completely agree with that. Yeah. And for myself, uh, it's also a process you learn uh, um, a lot while uh, being involved um, in it. So translating poetry myself was very important because you have to read as closely and as um, carefully uh, um, as never before, if you want to to uh, bring or if you want to smuggle uh, a, a foreign language poem into your own mother tongue, and uh, and translating those masters, uh, um, I have learned so much about their techniques, about their little tricks, about their ways of structuring their poems, uh, their ways of um, developing an image, uh, also their musicality uh, that has uh, uh, greatly benefits. Uh, benefited me for my own writing. Yes, absolutely. I think it's one of the, the most um, engaging, and as you said, one of the closest readings um, one can do is actually to engage in the art of translation. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. So. Yes, Jan, thank you so much. I would like to invite you, um, if you will, to, to read a couple of poems and to share your poetry with our audience. Um, I, I'll be happy to. I read... Um, Two poems, perhaps. Um, yes, please. Uh, one, one poem only in English mm -hmm. and one poem which is very short, uh, both in the German original to give you a, a, a taste of, of, the, of the sound possibly and, uh, and the English translation. Both translations are, um, are, have been done by uh, Ian Galbraith, uh, the poet and translator from Scotland. An essay on midges. As if all the letters had suddenly floated free of a paper and formed a swarm in the air. They form a swarm in the air. Of all that bad news telling us nothing, those skimpy muses, wispy pegasuses, only a buzz with a hum of themselves. 
made from the last twist of smoke as the candle is snuffed. So light you can hardly say they are, looking more like shadows, umbre, jettisoned by another world to enter our own. They dance, their legs finer than anything pencil can draw, with their minuscule sphinx-like bodies, the Rosetta Stone without the stone. And um, the second poem does play with a uh, uh, traditional form. It's a, a double haiku uh, poem. The German title is Teebeutel. Teebeutel. Eins. Nur in Sackleinen gehüllt, kleiner Eremit in seiner Höhle. Zwei. Nichts als ein Farben führt nach oben. Wir geben ihm fünf Minuten. Teabag. One. Draped only in a sackcloth mantle, the little hermit in his cave. Two. A single thread leads to the upper world. We shall give him five minutes. That was wonderful, Jan. Thank you so much. And thank you so thank much you. for being a guest um, on our Georgetown Literary Festival online edition for 2001. It would be so wonderful to invite you in the future to really come and visit Georgetown. I hope this is possible. Um, and really, I, lovely. yes, I think that we'd have, um, there was actually a very, quite an interesting and, and large audience for poetry here. So perhaps we could even think about translating your poetry into Malay for a Malay audience. Well, that, that would be a great honor and it would be a pleasure to meet all of you uh, uh, in person someday. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you.